ready? Hello, and welcome to the PhD in Educational Neuroscience Distinguished Lecture Series. Today, we are tremendously lucky, fortunate, and certainly honored to have Dr. John Gabrielli with us to present. Our theme for this year is Leaders in Educational Neuroscience. Dr. Gabrielli is the Grover Herman Professor of Health Science and Technology and Cognitive Neuroscience at MIT. He is first or primary author of more than 250 publications. He researches human cognitive neuroscience, focusing on brain development, specifically focusing on three areas, dyslexia, ADHD, and autism. Today, he is discussing how neuroscience can help people who have dyslexia. Dr. Gabrielli, welcome. Thank you. Uh, uh, it's an honor uh, to be here at this world famous university. It's an honor to be invited by Dr. Petito, whose research has been seminal in the understanding of the brain basis of human language. And I'm very grateful to have this opportunity to talk with you today. So, okay. It is always a speaker from MIT who cannot work his computer correctly. <laughs> Uh, my entire career, I've been fascinated by the human brain and its power and its fragility. Its power uh, to endow us with language, with emotion, with thought, and at the same time for every power it has, it has a sort of Achilles heel of fragility. So if it can let us pay attention, we can have difficulties paying attention. If it can let us be social, creatures who relate to other humans so powerfully, uh, we could have troubles relating to other people if we have autism. We could invent print, which is an incredible cultural invention, right, that before that you could not read what somebody else was thinking on the other side of the world or from two generations before you. It, it's uh, all over our culture at every moment as we, as we communicate on uh, a computer or newspapers or, or, and, and so on. Uh, and yet, for many individuals, some of these things are quite challenging. And so, one thinks that um, we're all born into a sort of neurobiological lottery where we'll be endowed with genes and environments and brains that will like, make life either more challenging or more easy for us in the specific culture that we're born into. And one of the remarkable things, as people have done more epidemiological research, has been how many children will find it challenging to succeed in the society that they're born into. So a difficulty in learning to read uh, depends on where you draw the line, but as many as 10 to 15% of children will qualify for a diagnosis of dyslexia. ADHD, the number is up to 11%. Autism, uh, I have to revise my slide practically every year. Uh, the current estimates are um, one out of 1.5% uh, of children, which is one out of every 42 boys, which is a remarkable number. And in many ways, we understand that these are not just differences, but sort of fits between a person and the society we have. So for example, before print, there was no dyslexia. Before people had to sit in rooms like this and pay attention, uh, from the age of five until 60, uh, if you're at a university. Uh, you, did, you, know, you could do many things in the world without the sort of attentional focus that we now demand in many of our cultural activities. So uh, uh, many children, as you struggle in one way or another, one out of eight children receive special education in public schools. So there's a tremendous number of children for whom life is uh, challenging uh, from the start. Now, when we want to understand something about the brain basis of it, uh, I'm going to talk to you about neuroimaging today. And we know we're very far 
from the cells and the small cell systems and circuits that subserve the human mind, the, 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 the brain that subserves the mind. Uh, so we have to have very broad pictures in brain imaging. But compared to about 20 years ago, we have much better pictures than we used to. And I'm going to talk to you today about neuroimaging using magnetic resonance imaging uh, for both structure and function. So when we think about dyslexia, I'm going to focus on that. We can think about, I think, two steps uh, in the field. The first step, and this is true for many kinds of brain differences, was simply to visualize and quantify brain differences associated with dyslexia. It wasn't that many years ago when people said, oh, you don't have a reading problem, you're lazy, or your parents aren't giving you a good education, or something like that. And so being able to visualize and measure the brain differences in a child who struggles to read compared to a ch child who does not just gave us uh, quantitative and objective evidence about brain differences associated with reading difficulty. And maybe in a more optimistic note, we're also able to visualize brain plasticity in response to helpful inter in, uh, remediation. So educational interventions that help children read better, we can actually see now structural and functional changes in the brain to potentiate that improvement uh, in their educational prospects. But I think beyond being able to see what's different and see that it can change, what we'd like to know is from this brain imaging, and I'll come back to this theme, how can we make life actually better for somebody? Not just understand things, but actually change things. Uh, and so I think that the way we, I imagine that brain imaging might actually improve the lives of people with dyslexia, and we're not really quite there yet, is to tackle traditional problems that are always part of, a, 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 of something with a learning difference. How can we have more accurate diagnosis? How can we better predict the prognosis or traject future trajectory of a child? How can we identify early so we can help children before they fail uh, instead of waiting for failure to trigger any kind of remediation? And lastly, and I won't talk about this today, but I think a really big topic is understanding individual differences, understanding which child will benefit from which kind of treatment instead of a one-size-fits-all kind of approach that we mostly had to take. So I'm going to talk to you today just a bit about the, what the causes of dyslexia and brain differences in dyslexia and some evidence about if there's intervention, how you can see the brain change. And then I'm going to talk about three studies uh, that I've done with my colleagues looking at diagnosis, prognosis, and early identification. So there's both an uh, optimistic and a pessimistic view of reading and print. The optimistic view is that reading involves an unbelievably creative and powerful fusion of two areas of the brain that were not originally linked so powerfully, that is between language and vision. Because uh, communication uh, it was traditionally oral, or now with sign language, uh, there's a fantastic other mode of communication. And I, one thing I've learned so much on this visit is how deeply similar sign language is to oral language. Uh, uh, so. Um, uh, but, you know, until people figured out that you could use print to address language systems, uh, people thought it, it could, there wasn't such a way. And I can't resist showing you this slide, which is not from my research, but from Holgren and Dale. Uh, because every once in a while, uh, I teach introductory psychology. And people say, really, I've heard somewhere that people only use 10% of their brain. Perhaps you've heard the story. Now, I've had days where I'm pretty sure I'm running on 10% of my brain. Uh, you might know people who you're pretty sure mostly use 10% of their brain. But I thought this is a beautiful uh, 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 picture from uh, magnetoencephalography, another method for looking at rapid changes in the brain for what happens in the brain when a brain reads a single word. And how from your right in the occipital cortex where vision begins, moving through language cortex, moving to the frontal cortex, you'll see a wave of activation. Then it will come back, a sort of double checking process, and it'll surge forward again. And all of that left hemisphere has been used to read a single word. So if we need all of that brain to read a single word, I don't think we want to give up any percentage of it. And it's much more than 10% just to read a single word. Now, when uh, people study uh, the natural development of spoken and heard language and sign language would work just the same way, um, uh, they mostly have to understand how miraculously it works. This is a, right, if people just say, how is it that a child can pick up these forms of language 
when neither the child nor the parent has a really excellent instruction manual for how to fundamentally transmit language from caretaker to child. So everybody studying these kinds of language acquisition, whether it be oral or manual, has to explain what seems like an almost miracle if it didn't exist. Nobody thinks about reading that way. Reading, even for the best reader, is a boot camp where governors will take credit or blame if the reading scores go up or down, where parents worry if their child is able to read effectively so that he or she can go on to learn all kinds of things in school. Uh, and it re requires formal, explicit instruction. It's anything but natural. And that's partly because any form of visual communication is only a few thousand years old. Widespread use of printing press is only a 500 years old. And even now, with electronic reading or tweets or any other form of communication, it's still reading, it's still letters. So we haven't changed that very much, really. Now, today, I will only talk about uh, English. But languages throughout the world use quite different strategies to visualize language and print. And I can't resist uh, uh, sharing with you the burden of English in this regard. Uh, uh, so we know some languages are regular, where there's a pretty much a one-to-one -one or near one-to-one -one correspondence between sounds and letters or small groups of letters. Uh, for Italian, there's approximately 33 uh, 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 letter combinations for 25 sounds. Uh, in English, there's over a thousand letter combinations that represent the 45 basic sounds of language. So uh, you're giving children quite, uh, you know, quite a quite a task where you say, "Here's some rules, but there's about a thousand exceptions." Okay, <laughs> now here you are as a fifth, as a five-year-old, go to it. Uh, uh, the only thing tougher, or one of the tougher ones, is Mandarin Chinese, where thousands of characters have to be learned. Anyway, back to English. Uh, in the United States, about 10% of children uh, have dyslexia, uh, an unexplained difficulty in learning to read, and why these numbers move around is there's no known dividing line really between dyslexia and poor reading. You can draw your boundary where you think is reasonable, but there's no dividing line. There's no brain picture you can take or test you can give that says here's a firm boundary between successful reading and struggling reading. What do we understand about the causes of dyslexia? Well, one thing we know is it's familial. It runs in families. So for example, if your twin brother or sister has it, uh, you, there's a 70% chance you will have it. And a few candidate genes have been identified, but they have low penetrance. They're com it's a com like many behaviors in humans, it's a complex uh, capacity that involves many aspects of genetics, none of them being very powerful by themselves. Psychologically, uh, the best understood cause of dyslexia is the phon phonological hypothesis about the processing of language sounds. Uh, although th there's other ways to process those sounds uh, through, through sign language. And the reason that was a big surprise until the 1980s was that for the typical child who had struggled to read, they seemed to speak and hear satisfactorily at home, arrive in school, and then unexpectedly not seem to be able to learn how to read print. And so people thought it must be a visual problem because the hearing and speaking is fine as the typical child enters this and starts to fail. And Bradley and Bryant in the 1980s demonstrated, and there's a lot of evidence that supports this, that for most children, the fundamental problem seems to be in the, a, a weakness in the processing of speech sounds. Not a broad hearing difficulty, but a specific speech sounds. And with that difficulty, it's hard to translate uh, language into print. And there's other causes as well, and it's likely the case that there's not one route to reading difficulty, but multiple combinations of routes that can get you there. So let me share with you just a couple of psychology terms. So what we imagine is there's approximately 45 phonemes or basic building blocks of sounds in the English language, in the spoken language, that those, those phonemes uh, uh, correspond when put together to, to words, like the name of a book. And that what the typical child does in learning uh, how to read is that he or she has to understand that the word book is composed of units. And it's those units, b, e, and k, that have to be mapped onto the letters or, so, or, or groups of letters on the text. They have to basically decompose a word they never knew had parts into those parts.
to be able to read. And in order to, uh, uh, that, that idea that, that words have units in them, people talk of phonological awareness, awareness that words have sound units in the word. And you need those units to map onto the letters to learn how to read. So why have the brain differences that have been observed in this dyslexia? Well, people have looked uh, to the uh, mo speech, knowing the phonological hypothesis, have looked a lot to the language systems of the left hemisphere, Broca's area, Wernicke's area, to areas traditionally involved in language. And a few, some number of years ago, with Elise Temple and Russ Poldrack, we had the opportunity to look at uh, uh, what's different in the brain of some 10-year-olds who are typical readers versus dyslexic readers. Now, you may wonder, if you have not been involved in this kind of research, how much children enjoy having their brains being scanned in an MRI scanner. I can't give you the real answer to that, because we're not allowed to run out and grab children and throw them in the scanner and have an epidemiologically representative sample of which children are you know, crying and want to be let out immediately and which ones are not. So all the children we see are volunteers whose families have volunteered. But I can tell you that overwhelmingly those children uh, report very positive experiences. Here's a spontaneous note that we received from a child some years ago. <laughs> the scanner is noisy. Uh, uh, so she draws a picture of the noisy scanner. And then she writes, Mariah, you've let me have more fun in three days than I could have in any other place. Just think of it. I'm playing a game when at the same time I'm a research guinea pig. If you're a hard grader, you would take off a point or two for spelling there. But, but you won't because, and who knows, I might help someone else my age if they have any brain problems while still earning money. And what do you think beats that? Nothing. Right? That's, the, that's the beautiful note, yeah, the, uh, you know, that uh, as we get older, it's harder to be, not be ironic in these things uh, uh, from a child who, who, who participated in research. We try to make the children comfortable uh, by having, an, uh, uh, that's not the real scanner, that's a pretend scanner, but to get them comfortable. And in this study now, uh, now about almost 15 years ago, um, uh, we examined uh, what's going on in the brain of children who are typically reading versus children who are about 10 years old and have a history and ongoing difficulties with reading. This is the task they performed in the scanner. I'll talk about two conditions. In this condition, they saw pairs of letters and had to simply decide whether the letters were the same or different. So P and P are the same, D and M are different. So you don't even have to know what those letters are about. Just by shape, you could tell that. And we compared what happens in the brain as children viewed, made those decisions to another condition where they saw pairs of letters like G and K and had to decide if the names of the letters rhymed or not. So G and K don't, but T and D end with that E sound, so the names of the letters rhyme. So we want to see what happens in the brain when the child's mind focuses on a sound associated with the letter. And this slide shows you, with functional MRI, the differences between the two groups. In the top row are typical children, and in the left hemisphere, seen in three consecutive slices going down the brain, one sees an activation in something near Broca's area and something near Wernicke's area, as these children think about the sound of a letter as opposed to its mere appearance. In the bottom row are the brains of children with dyslexia, and you can see there's no selective engagement of the bottom area, the posterior Wernicke's type area, and the, there's some displacement as well of the one towards the top of the picture or the frontal cortex. This finding of a brain difference in thinking about sounds associated with print is one of the most widely replicated findings in, in almost any study of any difficulty. So here's from some years ago, at least Temple's summary. Each uh, shape here is a different study that reported reduced or absent activation as children or adults attempted to associate uh, the sound of print with the look of print. Now, one thing we want to do is not just uh, no differences, but to try to be helpful uh, for those differences when they're difficulties. And it, we engaged in one study some years ago where we looked at one form of remediation uh, from a company called Scientific Learning. And these children, in addition to the schooling they got, played computer games that were meant to train 
their auditory uh, capacity to process rapid sounds uh, that might help them do a better job of mapping language onto print. This slide shows you the behavioral gains in the group with dyslexia. So we scanned uh, uh, both typical ch children before and after, so we'd see just the effect of practice. Here's my cursor. There. Um, and then we scanned children with dyslexia before and after the treatment. And you can see, although the treatment didn't in, in make them typical readers, it boosted their performance in a number of reading measures. So now we asked, uh, what's happening in the brains of these children? So I'm going to show you now from the sides the pictures you saw before, but viewed from the side, the activations in uh, frontal and temporal cortex for the thinking about the sounds of the letters and the diminished or, 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 or displaced activations in the children with dyslexia. The next slide shows you the brain plasticity associated with the partially affected remediation. That is, what you see, Dale, is the, children, the activations in the children who are poor readers on the left. Uh, that's the absence of activation. And you can see the growth of activation in exactly those areas that typically developing children turn on or activate when they're doing this task. So we thought at the time, and, I'll, and in a few minutes I'll tell you why we're rethinking this to some extent. We thought, well, this is exactly what you want to see. That remediation would help children who are not engaging a neural system that's supporting reading engage that neural system and support the reading. And maybe that's true, but let me show you what happened in the other hemisphere. So we had those changes in the left hemisphere that's dominant for reading, but we had big changes in the right hemisphere. And we gave them enables like normalization on the left and compensation on the right, which is very superficial. It's just a label because it doesn't really tell you what's happening. But we, by that we meant engagement of systems that are typically active versus engagement of systems that are not typically active and might be supportive in some way. And I'll come back just in a few moments to that. So let me talk about the diagnosis of dyslexia. And let me talk to you about a challenge, I think, that's very fundamental to our field. If you would have said, in something like 1990, before we had fMRI and before we had the Human Genome Project, that we would have the fantastic progress we now have in brain imaging, that we would have the fantastic progress we now have in genetics, you'd be amazed at how far we've come in many ways. And you would have thought that with all that knowledge about the human brain and about the human genome, that we would make lives better for people in some way. And yet none of the knowledge, I believe, has made practically any difference in anybody's lives. Please don't repeat this to any NIH or NSF program officer. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's turned out that the human mind and brain is just so complicated that even with all this extra knowledge, we have not been able to take the lessons learned and change how we educate, change how we treat in almost any fundamental way. And so when the, uh, for example, the basic book of uh, psychiatric uh, diagnoses, the DSM-5, came out in May of 2013, as you may know, that's the book from the American Psychiatric Association. That's the sort of Bible uh, of, of, of diagnoses uh, in neuropsychiatry, including developmental differences. Nothing was influenced by anything we know about the brain or anything we know about genetics. And it's not because the people who made the book were ignorant or didn't like brains and genes. It's because we haven't yet turned the corner where such knowledge informs practical benefits for people. And so I think one of the real challenges before us is not only to learn more about brain differences and genetic differences, but how do we translate that into something that actually helps individuals? So here's, one small, here's some small directions. And I can't say none of any, that we've done that yet, but it's a challenge I think that's before us. Uh, so here's one. Here's a definition of dyslexia. And why the definition matters, everything drives from the definition of a, of a, of a difference. Who gets services in schools? who gets involved in research, uh, all of those things are driven by the definition. Of, uh, how you define the problem is the problem that you work on. So historically, dyslexia was defined as a discrepancy between, for example, a typical or a high IQ, general intelligence, and a reading score. So we're going to pretend a person has an IQ of 100 and a reading score of 80, and people have said, well, that's a specific reading difficulty. It's not explained by the general capacity of the individual. 
And then you had other children who might have a reading score of 80 and an IQ of 80. And for many years, and even now this is a, a, a frequent view, it was thought, well, that's nothing. What do you expect? The child has an IQ of 80, they should read at 80, okay? Well, that's not a problem. That's, in fact, there was a term that people used, that's a garden variety poor reader was the, was the idea of the field. Um, and so, uh, so there's this discrepancy one, and it's also striking. And I can tell you that even now, if you send in papers for journals as a scientist, if you don't have something that looks like that discrepancy, there's a fair number of scientists who will say, yeah, that doesn't feel right to me if I don't see a big IQ gap with the reading. Um, so, uh, and in fact, many, many clinicians in schools still basically use that approach, although it's, I think it's somewhat diminishing. So much so that the federal government had to uh, pass legislation in 2004 saying they don't have to use that approach, okay, <laughs> because they were trying to tip them off. And why do we think that that approach uh, might be wrong in terms of who has a reading difficulty that could be helped by intervention? Well, it's because when people have asked, looked at the phonological deficit, it looks very similar whether you have a high IQ or low IQ. Tra uh, remediation that's helpful seems to have about the same effect. And so we wanted to ask with Famico Heft uh, whether, uh, what would the brain evidence be? Is a child who has a high IQ and a poor reader have a difference in their brain compared to a low IQ and a reader when it comes to phonological processing? So we had two samples, uh, one in Pittsburgh and one in Palo Alto in studies where we had uh, samples where we had children who had both properties. So what's shown in blue is the IQ estimate, what's shown in red is the reading score. See, so these are our typical participants who have what you find on average sort of balanced IQ and reading scores. Here are some individuals who have a pretty high IQ but a pretty low reading score. Those are the discrepant individuals. And here's some other children who have a low IQ and a low reading score, about the same reading score but a lower IQ. So we could ask this uh, uh, in the brain, does it matter what the IQ score is or is the brain difference the same regardless of IQ? The task that these slightly older children performed, because we had to challenge them, uh, we uh, had them ask whether, to judge whether words rhymed, and we made it extra hard by making the end spellings different. You couldn't just look at it and know the answer, you had to know what the sounds of the words are. And the next graph, uh, next figure looks scary, but it's very simple, okay? Uh, let me tell you what it was and then let me reinforce it for a moment. We found no difference whatsoever in the brain for phonological processing of this kind, whether you had a high IQ or a low IQ. That didn't matter, it only mattered whether you were a good reader or a poor reader. So uh, one's part in the parietal cortex, one's part in the fusiform cortex, uh, we can pick any one of these spots, but here's an example. The two blue bars are running together everywhere. Those are the high IQ and low IQ individuals with dyslexia. Here's the red bars, or the typical readers. You can see the blue bars are running together. That is in, spot, in both uh, Pennsylvania and California, um, uh, in both the parietal cortex and the, and the fusiform cortex. Uh, it didn't matter what your IQ was. If you were a poor reader, you failed to engage these areas. And so we think this is the kind of thing where the brain evidence can converge with behavioral and educational evidence uh, for strongly suggesting, for example, that a child with a lower IQ and a low reading score ought to get the same kind of intensive reading intervention that a child with a high IQ and a low reading score should get. So there's real consequences for how these things are diagnosed in terms of who gets services and who gets helped. And we're hoping the more the brain science contributes convergent evidence uh, the more we can understand which child will benefit from which kind of help. Prognosis or prediction of dyslexia. Uh, and this is an area I've been very interested in, not only in dyslexia, uh, but in other domains, which is uh, can neural imaging give us knowledge above and beyond behavior? So everything you've seen until now, and most of what you see in neuroscience, uh, we sort of tie together some form of behavior with the brain. That's what our goal is, is to understand how human behavior and the mind spring from the brain. But is it possible that where we are right now in our knowledge of things, that uh, brain imaging or uh, values can predict things above and beyond any behavioral measures currently available to us? So uh, can it predict things uh, better than reading, language, or other behavioral measures that are conventionally available to psychologists, researchers, and educators? So as children progress in their dyslexia, 
it's noted that some children compensate relatively well. That is, they don't become great readers, but they become pretty good readers compared to where they started. And other children don't make much progress. What's the brain basis of children who make a lot of progress versus those who don't? And can we say anything about predicting which child is in the luckier group who will progress a lot and which child won't? So in this study, we saw 25 children with dyslexia, 20 typically reading children, ages 10 to 16. At time one, we performed brain imaging on them, functional MRI, and a measure of structure. And they got 17 behavioral measures for language, for reading, for IQ, lots of behavioral characterization of the kinds of tests that are widely given by educators and researchers in this field. And then two and a half years later, we examined how they were reading. And here's how, here's how that went. So in this graph, this is time one, for the ability to accurately read single words. Here's the, here's the typically reading children from time one to two and a half years later. Now, it's not that they didn't become better readers over two and a half years, okay? Uh, but what happened was, these are age-adjusted scores. So they were above average to start with, and two and a half year, years later, they remain above average. Here's average. And far below average are the children with dyslexia. And there's red and blue, because we separated what turned out to be two groups. One group that showed no gain particularly over the next two and a half years. That is, they did not close the gap with their peers. They were poor readers to start with, and they remain equally poor readers a couple years later relative to their age. Then there was a second group of children who started at about the same point, but they made substantial progress. This was our key outcome, was accurately reading single words. But perhaps more importantly, this other graph shows the same groups for reading comprehension, that is, reading text and answering questions about the meaning of the text. Arguably, that's the most important thing, not getting word by word correctly, but being able to read text like you have to for school and understanding the content of that. And there, these children made dramatic progress. Look at the gap they closed over those two and a half years. So what in the brain predicted whether a child would be in the group that progressed versus the ones who did not? Here's what we found and why we were surprised. Reading is the dominant hemisphere. Uh, left hemisphere is the dominant hemisphere for reading. But the change, the, the brain activation that predicted who would get better two and a half years later was in the right prefrontal cortex. These red dots are individual children. And this shows you that the more they gained in reading ability over two and a half years, the more they turn on at the beginning this right prefrontal cortex. So it predicted to a large extent, who would get better two and a half years into the future in this thing that was so important for these children to get better at. But it's the wrong hemisphere. I'm going to underline that moment. It's what happened to the left hemisphere that's dominant for reading and typically developing children and adults. So uh, I'll just briefly say that it wasn't only functional imaging, but also structural imaging in right prefrontal cortex. So now we went back to the, to the results I showed you before. And we thought all the important stuff was happening on the left. But we think maybe some important things are happening on the right. And a kind of a thought is something like this. To what extent should education be trying to get everybody to do the same thing? And to what extent do we need to recognize that there's individual differences and some children will need to learn to read in a different way? That the strategy that's optimal for most people learning to read that's a left hemisphere strategy may at some points not be optimal. You, you can bother a student with a lot of educational remediation, but if that neural pathway is not available to them for some reason, maybe they're better off going a different way. So why, why is this a surprise? Well, for most of what we understand about reading, sort of summarizing broadly over a lot of literature, when children begin to learn to read, they're pretty bilateral, left and right hemisphere, in how they process print partly because letters are visual spatial entities at the beginning especially, like a B and a D are two visual uh, letters. And so what happens as children get better at reading is they switch from bilaterally processing those letters to having a predominantly left hemisphere processing, which we think brings the letters right into the language system. But that's on the basis of maturation and lots of reading skill. Additionally, there's evidence that for simple reading of words, 
as children progress and develop and become better readers, activations tend to move posteriorly. And broadly, this is interpreted as, as you become a better reader, you read more quickly, automatically, and fluently the single words and text in front of you. And that frees up your frontal cortex to do things like interpretation, analysis, look for irony, uh, historical context, all the thinking and problem solving that we associate with prefrontal cortex. Because now the posterior parts of your brain are automatically and fluently understanding what the text is. And so that makes it all the more remarkable that the children who progressed the most were the children who had the most activation in the right anterior part of the brain. It's the wrongest quadrant that you could have. It's the wrong hemisphere, and it's the front, not the back. And we also did one more kind of analysis uh, 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 called multivoxel pattern analysis using support vector machines, which are basically just algorithms devised by computer scientists to try to categorize worlds of stuff into two. Um, and so this, this is a map that shows you the voxels that help us best divide uh, people, children into those who would progress and those who would not progress. And we're really interested in this because in the end we want to do one more thing, which is we don't want to just have averages. We want to know for one child at a time uh, by behavioral and brain data who needs what kind of help. If we have averages forever, we won't recognize differences amongst children in what will help them. So we're very interested, as many people are in our field, in developing computer algorithms that will help us get better and better, not just saying on average a group is like this, but child by child, what's their likelihood of succeeding or failing in a certain way. So um, here's the remarkable thing. Of the 17 behavioral measures they got, reading measures, language measures, IQ measures, and others, none of them predicted which child would progress or not progress over the next two and a half years. Now, this is not a field that I work in in terms of education. It's a very education clinical field. And so for a few months, we thought we just didn't know the right papers. And so we consulted everybody we could. Uh, and they told us, no, we don't know which 10-year-old will have dramatic progress in the next couple of years and which ones do not. We just do not know that. Uh, and yet, you know, when we combine these brain measures, uh, uh, we approached in our best analysis in this one study, 92% accuracy with, with that last analysis I showed you of predicting one by one which child would be in the group that improves and which would not. And so we, uh, we put the word neuro in front of the word prognosis and said neuroprognosis. Can we use brain measures to predict long-term outcomes above and beyond our current behavioral measures? Now this could change tomorrow because we might have a better behavioral measure tomorrow. So this is, this is it for all time. Uh, but I just had a, got, got the chance to, to write a review paper in Neuron where we reviewed dozens of papers in many domains where brain evidence is either adds too significantly or is considerably better than any current clinical or educational measure in predicting, for example, whether a child will benefit from a particular math curriculum, in predicting whether a patient with depression or anxiety will benefit from a particular uh, drug or behavioral therapy, far beyond uh, what, what now is available by clinical analysis or behavioral test scores. So we're very excited about whether these brain measures will allow us to predict futures. And our goal, of course, is not to predict, but to help. Uh, and and but we can send people towards forms of education or clinical treatment that are likely to benefit the person. The last topic I want to talk about is early identification of dyslexia. And why that's an important topic is this. There's kind of a paradox of diagnosis currently which is that there's overwhelming evidence that the interventions or treatments, which are all phonologically based uh, t teaching methods, intensive teaching and often on a small groups, that all of those are um, uh, uh, most effective when children are youngest, kindergarten, first grade, second grade. And yet, in many school systems in the United States, uh, and diagnoses are not made until uh, often third grade. Now, I'll tell you why they do that. But we know there's a tremendous human cost to that. Because what they're really waiting for is to know with certainty, because a child is failing so badly that she or he has dyslexia. Because by third grade, it's really evident. Because they're unable, they're far behind their peers. But this is bad in several different ways. Uh, the first is uh, you're, you're not helping the child when they're most capable of being helped. Second, and at least as important, you're, uh, it's a very brutal path for that child. If you've been around children with dyslexia, 
one thing I can tell you is they're extremely aware of their difficulty. In fact, we found that they were about 80%, first and graders are about 80% accurate in knowing how good a reader they are. Okay? That's better than most of us knowing how good we are at anything. And the reason is because as they, as they sit there, they see the performance of their classmates to their left and to their right, and they can easily tell if they're behind their classmates. This is very discouraging for a first grader or a second grader to feel like he or she is behind all of his or her classmates on something that's so fundamental to educational experience. And so this late diagnosis is just waiting for failure to trigger help, and by then, you've already lost some of the help you can provide, both in terms of the emotional and social health of the child and in terms of the reading capacity. So what could we give a pre-reading kindergartner that would help us tell this child is at great risk of reading failure? Well, there's quite a bit of uh, evidence that suggests uh, that if we can give them three kinds of tests. One, phonological awareness. In this case, there's no reading involved. Children are asked to perform various kinds of tasks. Number two, how rapidly they can name simple objects. And number three, their let letter knowledge. And so you might ask, well, if we have these tests that are pretty good at predicting which child is going to fail at reading before he or she even begins to read, why isn't this used widely? And the answer is there's modest sensitivity and specificity. Um, and so let me say a word about that. So you can take these test scores and you can say if the children score very, very poorly, uh, we'll classify that as a kindergartner at risk for reading failure. And you will get all, if you take very low test scores, you will get almost every child who is likely to fail. But you'll miss about half the children who really will fail. And then you say, okay, that's, that, I can fix that. And the way I'll fix it is I'll, uh, I'll make the score higher so I get more children in there. So the evidence is that if you make the score more liberal and you get more children into your at-risk group, you will identify almost every child who will fail at reading but you'll identify wrongly false positives. About, uh, about half of the children in your sample will be will just fine in reading. So the schools are loath to make an early diagnosis because there's such developmental variability amongst children that, that they would have too many, either not enough children classified as at risk or too many. And so they would have to deliver uh, uh, resource demanding uh, treatments for children who never will have a reading problem. So, you know, the, Educate, the educational system, there's a lot of issues. I had a nice discussion earlier about policy issues in neuroscience and education. Um, um, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, the, the, it's not that the educators are callous, it's that they're, they're waiting for somebody to deliver to them a near certain uh, identification of a child who will struggle to read before reading failure occurs. So with Nadine Gabb and Elizabeth Norton, uh, we've been uh, with, supported by NIH to do a, a study looking at kindergartners before they begin to read. And the approach was that we went out to 19 area, very diverse schools, uh, district charter schools, private schools, religious schools in the Boston area who would collaborate with us. And they allowed us to come in and test every kindergarten whose parents gave permission. And so we tested, it's a little higher than this actually, we tested over three years about 2,000 kindergartners. From those, we got a fair number who either seemed to be at high risk or who did not. We brought in about 180 of those for brain imaging at MIT. And we're tracking those children over the next several years so we can try to discover which child is succeeding at learning to read and which child is failing. But we're looking at these children now before they ever receive reading instruction. And the measure I want to share with you today is something called diffusion tensor imaging. It's a measure that looks at brain structure uh, and looks at the white matter connectivity of the brain. So the white matter is the myelin sheath that surrounds axons. I'll show you in a picture. And what this, measure, what this method does is it measures the movement of water molecules at very tiny distances in the brain. So here's a cartoon of the nerve axon. The axon is what leaves a nerve cell to communicate information to another neuron. And uh, it, if it has a, this axon, if it goes any distance, is myelinated so the signal can go rapidly and accurately to the next neuron it's communicating with. Now, if you're a drop of water and you're in a place like cerebrospinal fluid, you can float wherever you want to. You're free to go. If you're near a myelinated axon and you're a molecule of water, it's a big obstacle for you physically. And you have to flow parallel with that uh, myelinated group of axons or tract. 
And using that information, which is an indirect measure of white matter uh, properties in the brain, we can quantify uh, uh, data. So let me show you, the, this is a, hopefully a fun picture. So this is an individual, and this is showing you the diffusion tensor imaging. The colors tell you which way the fibers appear to be going by the water evidence. Uh, and uh, this, is the, this is the sort of super information highway that connects distant parts of the brains into complex networks that allows all of us to do amazing things. So this is one individual's brain. Now, some years ago, Torfo Klingberg and I uh, did a study looking at adults with reading difficulty. And using this kind of a measure, we saw that there were differences in the left hemisphere, in this temporal parietal area, pretty close to where the fMRI differences were, uh, in the white matter of people who were adults who were good re at reading or poor at reading. And furthermore, oops, let me see, sorry. Uh, if you look at this graph, and there weren't many participants in the study, um, if we looked at the white matter index, you, you could see that whether you're a poor reader or a good reader, it's as if the more you have this property of white matter, the better reader you were. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's, this person is the kind of person who probably reads War and Peace every summer just for fun. All right? All right? Uh, so uh, we couldn't tell in about, about 12 years ago when we did this study whether this brain difference is the cause or consequence of reading difficulty. This is a profound issue in looking at brain variability uh, in different developmental differences or, or all kinds of disorders. Are the brain differences that all the ones you've seen today, but let me focus on the structural one you just saw, are they the cause of the reading difficulty or the consequence of the reading difficulty? And what do we mean by that? Well, look, we're looking for the causes. That's what we most of all want to understand. But let me tell you one example of a consequence of being a poor reader. Children who are poor readers don't like to read. All right. I mean, none of us like to do things that we're terribly poor at. So children who are poor readers not only struggle in school, but they tend not to want to read at home or in the summer, and to an astounding degree. So one diary study in Canada found that in fifth grade, a good reader may read as many words in two days as a poor reader does in a year. So there's an astounding difference in practice and experience in good readers versus bad readers that are far beyond the classroom. So when we see a brain difference, is that because of this astounding experiential difference? We know experience changes the brain. Or is it closer to the etiology? So it only took about 15 years for us to take a step on this question. And here's the last finding in the last step. So we looked at a, a standard test of phonological awareness. Uh, these are the kinds of tests given to children. They don't need reading knowledge. For example, they have to say the word bold, and now they have to say bold without the b, so they have to decompose the sounds of the words into units. Or blend words, they're asked, what do these sounds make, t, an oi, or, or repeat non-words. So these are all tests of phonological awareness. They're not about meaning, they're about the sound units of the word. And we focused in, in this analysis with Zainab Sagan and Elizabeth Norton on the left arcuate fasciculus. So this is a pathway that connects the major languages areas of the brain, Wernicke's area posteriorly, and Broca's area anteriorly, or here's in a, in a real postmortem brain. And we looked at this white matter in uh, a number of tracts. And the next graph is again a little complicated, but I'll just tell you the bottom line. What we found is only in the left arcuate fasciculus, in these kindergartners who are pre-readers, so reading could not have made much of a difference in their brain, reading experience. We found that for this test of phonological awareness, so intimately tied later on to reading, uh, that there were differences in the size and characteristics of the left arcuate fasciculus before the reading began. And basically a larger one and one more organized by our measures went with better phonological awareness, a strong statistical predictor of poor reading. So here's the last tiny bit of a data, it's not even data, this is almost anecdotal, but it's poured from that data. Uh, you know, here, we, we're tracking these children, we don't know how the story will play out, but it's almost as if, but as the child begins the epic journey of learning to read and education, 
that some children, for reasons we do not know, uh, have you know an arcuate fasciculus that's more likely to make reading easy or more likely to make reading difficult. And this is before the first lesson of the first day of reading around uh, Thanksgiving in Massachusetts. Um, and we don't know, by the way, when you see this, sometimes people think, well, it must be genetic. But it could be, we, we know that early experiences are terribly important. So we, can, we don't know to what extent this is genetic versus environmental, but we do know, or there's a suggestion anyway, uh, that you know, one child is sitting in a room with one kind of arcuate fasciculus, another with another arcuate fasciculus, and life will be more or less challenging depending on whether they've drawn something positive or negative in this neurobiological lottery. So I've talked with you about causes of dyslexia, brain differences, how, uh, plus how intervention can change the brain through plasticity, and more recently, how we might use neuroimaging to have better diagnosis of dyslexia, more scientifically based ones, how we can predict far beyond current behavioral measures uh, how a child will progress, and how brain measures might contribute to early identification so that we can get early services to children, don't wait for failure, but begin help before a child ever fails. I've been able to do this research through fantastic collaborators. Thank you very much. We have time now for a question and answer session. So if you have anything that you would like to ask, please come to the front of the room. Um, I know uh, when in your research, when you talked about the white matter, you talked about how that um, relates to what we know about dyslexia. Is there any put research that's happening that, have to, that has to do with prosthetic stimulation of certain areas to see if that type of stimulation can help with reading? And I'll just go back to my seat okay. for your answer. So I'm not aware of any research that, that has looked at that really interesting question, but it's incredibly timely to do so. Uh, uh, there's methods, uh, TDCS or T, uh, T especially, that are pretty benign. Uh, I think parents, I think it would be a tougher path to go for parents who want neural stimulators implanted in their five-year-old child's brain, although if it, you know, maybe we're just being uh, shy about how we can really help people, but there's really quite interesting studies using um, these uh, other kinds of brain stimulation methods uh, that I think will be really interesting to look at. I, I know several people who are just starting to do those kinds of studies, uh, and uh, so I, I think that's a great idea, and especially if we could do it early maybe influence uh, the development of these pathways and, 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 the, and the neocortex that's connected by them. So it's a hugely exciting opportunity um, uh, to use some methods. So TDCS, for those of you who don't know this, is basically they put a battery on your head and put two wires. So don't do this at home without permission of uh, an IRB. Uh, but but it's, a, it's, it's, very, it's a very safe, shockingly low-tech method that's shown some quite interesting influences on, 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 on brain functions. Um, so I, I think that's a great, very exciting idea. Thank you. So this was population that was monolingual, am I correct? Overwhelmingly, yes. Um, I have seen children who grew up bilingual and would have more difficulties with English versus another language which had more phoneme grapheme correspondence. And do you think some of these differences in which areas are um, more uh, implicated in dyslexia could be parsed out by looking at bilingual children? So I'm a little nervous to, to answer it because <laughs> there are people who are so much more expert than I, you know, world-class experts, and I, I am not on this topic. Um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very harsh thing because, uh, a challenging thing, I mean, in increasingly, we live in a bilingual or trilingual world. The reality is, in the schools we go to, just the whole culture of the world, and certainly the United States, so increasingly, we, we have to be thinking about multiple languages, and not only multiple oral languages, but perhaps sign and languages in this context of dyslexia as well. And um, uh, there's just been so little research on that because it's hard to organize, and so to a fault, you know, we've tended to go for children where they have a strong monolingual background. 
uh, because the complexity, like, because then we have to worry about, which we have to get to, um, like as you're pointing out, is the other language besides English, let's pretend in the United States, is it a, is it a, is it an alphabetic language also? Is it a, is it a, is it a more regular language? You know, and all of a sudden, uh, our, our, our participant characteristics uh, quadruple, right, <laughs> or, or worse than that. So, uh, so, but I, I think that we just have, you know, we're gonna have to bite the bullet and deal with the complexity of, of children in the real world as they are. So I think the research has been shockingly narrow. I can tell you, just to pick another example, uh, up until very recently, we were supposed to, by and large, exclude children with ADHD because to get pure samples. We now know that about half of children with ADHD have reading difficulties, and about half of children with dyslexia have some attentional difficulty. So we're, we're aware that we've made these incredibly artificial simplifying models uh, to make our research life easier, and we have to go beyond that. So I, I say this with like a mea culpa, that we, we've, we've, in our studies, uh, to have any kind of uniformity, we've had children out with m many different kinds of language backgrounds, but we've always asked that English be a, an early learned uh, language for them. Um, but uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm sorry that we're just way behind on, on that question, which is so fundamental for, for, the, for the reality of children. Thank you. Hi. Um, you mentioned that the children who compensated had right frontal activity, and that they may need we may need to think about alternate methods for reading that not everyone can learn the same way. Do you have any suggestions or ideas about what those alternate methods are and what the children may be doing, and whether that might involve visual spatial something because that's so often cited as um, more developed in children with dyslexia? So that's a great question. And, and uh, as embarrassed as I was on that previous question, I'm going to be embarrassed on this one. We don't know what's going on in that right prefrontal cortex. We just don't have a characterization of it. Uh, uh, my inst as a beginning hypothesis, I wouldn't be surprised if it's more visual spatial. I wouldn't be surprised if maybe, and I'm going to tell you this now, this is not un unscientific anecdotal things. When I talked to some high school students who had a background of dyslexia, but had made a lot of progress and were really excellent students. They said that they get through material, but if they have to stop and read it aloud, they're finished. So I think those children are doing something quite different uh, than typically reading children, you know, for whom uh, the, the sounds and sight of language are strongly aligned. I, th I get an instinct is what you're describing, I agree with that, uh, that those children are, are doing some very visual approach to words that's letting them sail through words. A potentially a little bit like uh, what used to be taught in speed reading, which is to diminish uh, phonological analysis and let you go faster. And it probably comes at a cost, mm -hmm. but it may be for them, given everything that's available to them, their talents and their, and their, and their uh, limitations, the best way to make progress. So this gets, you know, when I talk to teachers, they often say, uh, everybody agrees that for the, you, know, you want to have this early phonologically inspired uh, treatment early on, because we know it helps a, a fair number of children. But you know, at some point, it's, 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 we have to explore experimentally, I think, because we just don't know whether we should have some very different approach uh, yeah. for later stages of reading, one that's much more orthographic, one that's much more, and now I'll get myself in trouble, uh, almost whole word oriented. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. uh, not, not because we think that's a, you know, but because, because maybe that's something like that, something quite different, uh, might be optimal for that kind of a child than for most other children. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so you know, when I say whole word, I get, Lots of people are very upset, and there's many, we, and we don't really know what the interpretation of that right prefrontal uh, uh, activation is. But if we understood that better, which we, I, it'd be great if we could, you know, maybe we would know what's a better path to send the more advanced reader on, and even if it's never going to be the deeper phonological approach that's probably makes reading easiest, it might be the best approach that person can take for his or her own purposes. So your question's great, and I'm embarrassed this one too that we don't know better what that right prefrontal activation signifies. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, wonderful talk. I uh, enjoyed it thoroughly. And I think you're right that it's very important that we move beyond correlational analyses um, that, you know, X happens when we see Y or what have you. 
and that you're now looking at causative relationships. And in doing that, we're starting to gain deeper understandings of what's really going on. With your DTI work, that really, I can see how that really helps us understand the relationship. Should we be doing neurodiagnoses or prognoses, I think was what you called it? Should we be doing neuroprognoses? Um, given that you said, what was it, it was 92 or 97% more effective than the other 17 behavioral measures. Should we be using DTI on all children? I know that DTI can be used with fairly young children because it's fairly passive that you just you know lay there and then are scanned, that you don't have to engage in any tasks. But I also know in one of your publications, you talked about using ERP and that when you look at particular ERP uh, potentials when it came from children that were just a few days old and they were born into families who were known to have dyslexia, should we be using ERP with these children or are you pr proposing a particular methodology for identification of neuro, uh, neuroprognoses? Thank you. I mean, that's a great question. Uh, so so I, I'm in favor of doing whatever works, and we have to do the research to discover that. Uh, and it could be FNIRs, it could be ERPs. Uh, we just have to try. I mean, we have a very small basis of this, uh, but we have evidence in a number of different ways, uh, both from our work but from other researchers, that these brain measures, to a surprising extent, improve our accuracy of predicting outcomes. Um, so. Uh, you know, we'll just have to do the science to discover. Obviously, something like ERPs or, or, or FNIRs could be deployed in schools or in hospitals more widely than MRI. Uh, and we just have to look over time what turns out to be uh, the most powerful method at the moment. But uh, I'm very excited that some method or combination of methods might greatly enhance our ability to A, identify children early, not wait for trouble, uh, and, and all the secondary consequences of the difficulties. And then second, also track them to what would be optimal treatment approaches. Uh, so, uh, it, it, so I, yeah, I'm very excited about this possibility. Some people, were, when they hear that, say, well, isn't that going to be expensive, especially if it's MRI? So I know you and I discussed this a little bit before, but uh, I, I think you can make the uh, economic argument that even for MRI, so an MRI, you know, maybe is, uh, we have a cheap rate but, uh, for research, but, uh, you know, maybe it's $1,000. Um, it costs at least that much to have a, a clinical workup. Uh, uh, and that, that's never mind all the extra services. And that's just dollars and cents, never mind the, the future and spirit of the child involved. So, I, But I think by pure economics, uh, uh, even MRIs, when now you, I don't think you take every child, uh, but I think what you could do is something like screen behaviorally, ha have a very liberal cutoff, and then do something more uh, specific with, with that, you know, 30% of children, let's pretend, who might be at risk so that you can, you can get closer to 100% accuracy in predicting which child will really struggle. And I think we have tremendous opportunities to improve that, uh, certainly for reading disorders, but I think for other things as well. Um, uh, I mean, there's suggestive data from everything from childhood depression to ADHD and so on. That we're, just, we're waiting for uh, so often for, for people to be miserable, to be behind, and that initiates action, and I'm hoping you know, everything we understand in cognitive neuroscience and some of these measures will allow us to initiate action to, to rescue children before they fall. Thank you. Hi, and thank you for your talk. I was sitting there wondering, when you talked about um, not knowing exactly what that um, right prefrontal activation means and what you know, is going on there. Do you have any ideas about how we can investigate that and how we can figure out what's going on there in a way that would actually help us? So I don't have a great idea. Uh, but, you know, I, I think one thing we could do, for example, is to do other experiments with the same children in, in one study to see what turns on that area. Uh, uh, we could also do, uh, I think, uh, something like transcranial magnetic stimulation to shut down that area briefly in those children and see, you know, see what the consequences are. So I think we could explore that in those, you know, and I think we would want to do it with the very same set children in which we're looking at that activation. Uh, so uh, we would, through some combination of correlational and causal studies, try to nail down uh, the thing that we don't know is what mental process is signified by that. Um, uh, so. Uh, I, I think it's, it, until we know that, it's hard even to know what educational implication any of this has. Uh, uh, and because if we understood what it was, 
I'm not sure. Let's pretend it's visual spatial analysis of letters. Yeah, then we might say, let's do a lot more training of visual spatial analysis of letters for, for children who are at this age with, and who are not otherwise likely to, to make progress. So what, what I think is, you know, when we think we're 92% accurate or whatever the number was in knowing if a child would progress or not, amongst ourselves we discuss, well, if you're a parent of one of those who is in the good group, that would be good news to get. Imagine you could tell a parent as a teacher or a physician, uh, good news, your child has a 90% chance of making terrific progress in the next two and a half years. But there's an equal number of children for whom you would say, if this evidence held up, you know, within a 90% chance your child won't be in a group that makes terrific progress. And so that's the group that we have to worry about, right? And that, and that you know, what can we do differently in that group? Um, and, so, and so that's even a trickier question, right? Because, you know, what we'll see probably in the brain is what's going on in the ones who make the progress, but the ones who don't, who don't activate that, what are they doing that's not helpful? Uh, that could be helpful. So, yeah, I, 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 but it, for, for any of this to be translated into something useful educationally, we have to pursue the questions you asked. You just mentioned um, using DTI and that that could identify children in a fairly reliable way, that that could predict their eventual reading abilities. But if you if you can't scan all of the kids, of course I understand that. But is there, do we have a really reliable behavioral measure that you know can give us something similar to what we get from the DTI data just so that we don't have to scan all kids? So that's what we have now. So we do have these measures of phonological awareness, letter naming and rapid naming, and, and so why don't we use that uh, nationwide or statewide to screen children and, and give them services? And the answer is the ones we have now aren't specific enough for uh, taxpayers and school systems to start to deliver resource demanding help to children because they say too many children are misidentified. Either we miss too many or we over identify, right? So this could change tomorrow. I, mean, I remember we were, you know, when we were. Uh, communicating earlier today, you know, somebody could come up with a better behavioral analysis tomorrow. And the, uh, the, but at the moment where we are, and these tests have been developed over several decades now, uh, they have limited specificity and sensitivity in predicting outcomes. So, you know, we, we think it, it would be justified, perhaps with people getting an initial behavioral screening and then with something like a brain measure, if you could get to a much higher level, a high enough level that you could say, you know, scientifically, medically, and ethically, that these children should get services uh, before they fail to read because we're so certain they will fail that we don't want to wait for all the devastation of failure uh, to begin to think about help for three or four years from now. So, uh, you know, I, of course I do imaging. You know, they, they, they say that, you know, if you're a, if you're a, uh, if you're a hammer, everything's a nail, right? So I do brain imaging, so I think the brain imaging is the answer to everything. Uh, but. Um, but I, I, I think, you know, that the data bear out that at the moment where we are in knowledge, and, and, and you know, what it really speaks to, and now there's a lot of terrific psychologists here, so, and, and I'm a huge fan of psychology and behavior, our, our understanding of the mind is so modest, as of the brain, as of genetics, it's so modest that we often don't know what's going on, you know, much more than we used to. But if we say, this particular child, how will she or he do? This particular patient, how will he, he or she respond to a particular treatment? We're unbelievably hit and miss all over the place when it comes down to individuals and the consequences for their lives. We just don't understand enough. And so I think the brain measures in some number of places, including dyslexia, seem like a pretty good proxy for getting a lot better at knowing uh, what the f fate of a person is and a suggestion about how you might rescue them from an unwanted fate. So let me pick one other example for 30 seconds. Uh, uh, say say for, for anxiety or depression or social anxiety, for any given treatment, half or more of patients will not respond beneficially to that. It will, perhaps it will surprise you or not, depending on what experience you've had, that uh, that's just how treatments happen now. The physician gives the treatment he or she thinks is a best guess. If you remain anxious, depressed, or miserable, uh, they hope you come back to try another treatment. Okay? It's amazingly true. Um, and, 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 and so, uh, you know, we're very excited in those domains as well that there's evidence, and we have some other groups, that brain measures can often 
much better predict which individual will respond to which particular treatment. So it's not that brain imaging is so amazing, it's that our understanding of people and the variation in people is so modest in terms of how their life will play out, how they will respond to an education or a medical intervention, uh, that there's so much room for improvement even when we barely understand what we're doing in the brain imaging. Thank you. Hi again, and thank you for such a nice talk. Um, I've got two things that I wanted to share. One, just a comment having to do with what you said about the impact on policy, and then the second might actually be something more for the audience's benefit, and you can just sort of add to that uh, second comment. So uh, several people have already mentioned, um, you know, if we know that some children's brains process differently, and if we can identify them before they enter school or before it's too late. There's one part in your talk where you said 70%, that's a really big number, 70% of children whose family members have dyslexia are, will likely have dyslexia or siblings. And the same goes for hearing identification. We have um, newborn hearing screenings and it's now mandated that all children um, must have that uh, hearing test, regardless of whether their parents are identified as being at risk for having a deaf child or not. And I think it, maybe it's more expensive to do this type of universal screening for dyslexia, but do you think there could be a policy impact or potential for impact uh, on at least the families who are known to be more at risk with dyslexia so that we can require some kind of scanning at least for those children? So it's sort of a, I guess, uh, if so you want to respond to that, then I'll add my second thing. So let me give you the, 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 the answer that, er, that all, everybody dreads to hear from a researcher, that more research needs to be done. No, it, we don't have enough uh, uh, evidence yet, quite yet, I think, um, to you know, be able to make a persuasive case for change in public policy and, and the economics that go with that. But I think we're in a direction where we could in the foreseeable future. And I wish it were fast. I'm, I'm, all, I'm always shocked at how slowly research moves. Uh, in terms of actually helping people um, uh, for, for all of us. But uh, yes, I, I, the, the, the vision you describe is exactly the vision you know, that I, I, I'm hoping for uh, as well, which is that we get good enough about this soon enough uh, that it seems like the right thing to do uh, from, from an ethical perspective first and then from a practical economic one. Um, so uh, I, I'm very excited about whether the right kind of brain screening, and I don't know what the method is uh, uh, yet that will be optimal, um, you know, may be helpful in various ways. And of course, with brain imaging or EEG or whatever, uh, we're talking about dyslexia today, but it's quite possible the very same brain images might be good for, for example, identifying people at risk for developing schizophrenia, risk for depression. I mean, once we have the brain evidence, uh, if it turns out to be one that's not very tied to a particular task, uh, we may be able to screen people for many different things uh, and, and think about ways to prevent uh, great difficulties for people. So, I, you articulated beautifully. Uh, you know, I, I think the hearing tests at birth are, are kind of the vision of of, um, of how we might think about other things, and so that we can help people right support people right away. Great, thank you. And then the second thing is possibly more for the audience. Um, the two of us talked uh, briefly this morning about about the fact that um, deaf children do often have phonological awareness through sign language and they that will arrive to the same place in the brain that sound arrives to that it seems that it has more to do with phonological processing and phonological awareness that children who are um, able to hear access this phonology phonology of their spoken language i'm wondering if it's easier and faster to identify deaf children as dyslexic because of their use of finger spelling. So they're, um, the fact that they use a manual alphabet, you see the letters that they're forming when they're communicating with you. And we know that children initially spell based on shape and maybe that's where the right side of the, the right hemisphere comes in because they're spelling based on shape. So not finger spelling based on the printed word and what they know is uh, what letters correspond with those hand shapes, but instead the overall shape of the word. So sort of akin to looking at tall letters and short letters and how a kid might identify printed words. There might be something about uh, the way that deaf children who are exposed to sign language, when they're learning fingerspelling, they're looking at the overall shape of the word first. 
And I, I do know parents who have said that they've identified that their children have language difficulty at very young ages because of the fact that they're simply fingerspelling in a way that looks very different than typically developing children. So I wonder if there's some way that we can gain insight into a deaf child's mind based on their use of fingerspelling because it gives us feedback from that visual modality and I wonder if that could be used for hearing kids too so that it's an advantage for everyone, not just for deaf kids. So I guess that's somewhat of a comment, maybe a little bit of a question, but just wanted to share that. So, so I, I've had uh, one of the great things today is I, I've learned so much. Uh, I, I'm sure I've learned more than you know I've imparted to, to anybody today, um, and uh, including again the, the deep similarities between uh, early learned sign language and uh, an, an oral communication uh, in the brain, and and um, uh, and then you and I discussed that it might be uh, 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 even despite those similarities that, that finger spelling might be really an interesting thing to think about, and I agree with you, because uh, the, the, as I mentioned earlier, for oral uh, communication, children, you know, of course children who have tremendous trouble with language, will have trouble reading, but for so many children with dyslexia, there's no apparent pro problem in, in um, oral language communication, and it's just a big surprise when they fail, and you pointed out the finger spelling is a big hint, and that might be, I'm looking at Dr. Professor Petito on this to correct me if, it, but but that could be an interesting special clue. It's just as you said that might be divergent uh, between these two modes of of, of, of language uh, and an early hint that's not evident in oral language. Um, so I think that was a fantastically interesting idea, Dr. Erzing. Right to make language visual and that there's benefits for everyone, which is even more reason to encourage people to learn sign language, even if the child is hearing. Thank you. There are no further questions? Okay, then I'd like to say thank you so much, Dr. Gabrielli, for such a wonderful presentation. For those of you in the audience, we have two more um, lectures coming up in our series for the academic year. On March 12th, we have Dr. Carol Patton coming to the university, and on April 2nd, We'll have a talk by Dr. David Clar. With that, I'd like to say thank you for coming and thank you once again to Dr. Gabrielli.